camera people and welcome to episode 5 of the Auto Guide show. We are the editors of autoguide.com and it's many many sister sites. Um, this week we will be talking about a whole bunch of crossovers. So we have the Subaru Ascent, Honda Pilot, Volkswagen Atlas, the Lexus UX, and a fun one, a BMW M5. Yeah! <laughs> so, Not just crossovers. I know, there's, that's the one saving grace we have on this week's episode. Uh, a new episode drops every other Friday on YouTube or your favorite podcast player. And of course, please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment, and all that stuff so you never miss an episode. Uh, we have a reader question this week, which Ooh. is what we'll start off with, and it's from Diwa Galvez, mm -hmm. who asks, does having an all-wheel drive like a Subaru mean that you don't have to swap your all-season tires for winter tires during the winter? No. The answer is no. no. So much no. The easiest way to put this is even if you have all-wheel drive, you definitely, definitely need a dedicated set of winter tires because all-wheel drive does nothing to help you stop. Fun story, I have a friend called Julian, hey Julian, I have nearly killed him twice because, I have because of all seasons in a snowstorm. Uh, both times I jumped on the brakes, one car had ABS, one car didn't, didn't matter. <laughs> both of them just went sliding and I had to take evasive maneuvers. I am such a good driver that I didn't run into him. Although the first time it was in, he was driving my car also, so I nearly ran oh. into my own car okay. because of all because of all seasons. But this is clearly because, because this was in your younger, stupider days when you didn't buy winter tires. Exactly. I mean, all-wheel drive comes with benefits um, by sending power to each wheel or, or all four wheels as needed. But the key here is that tires are, for, are are the thing that connects your car to the road, and that's what dictates all your performance. Even if it's, we're not talking, even if we're not talking about winter tires and we're talking about performance tires, it's all about the tires because that's what just translates anything that's going on in the car, in the engine bay, with the powertrain, and puts it onto the road. And those tires are an essential part of the whole package. It doesn't matter if you've got front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, or all wheel drive. If you've got good winter tires, that's going to make the difference. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Sammy. No problem. I will drive just as you farther into the ditch. That's well, I can well, see there's a big benefit in helping you like get going in the course, snow, yeah. which, you know, if you have winter tires, you'll, you'll know how to go and stop. You'll be able to do both. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Um, and the thing about winter tires is that they're made from special rubber that helps your car perform better in cold temperatures. They have special tread patterns that give you uh, more grip in the snow by like packing more snow into it because snow on snow grips better than snow on rubber. Fun fact. Uh, and thank you for your question. If you have any questions, make sure to email us at tips at autoguide.com or leave a comment on the YouTube video or the post on autoguide.com. That was a quick question, actually. That was a... Uh a lot, a lot quicker than last year, last week's question. It had an easy answer. <laughs> yes. That was like not really up for debate, uh, and we like debating. So if you really want to see us fight, ask us a controversial well, question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think we can take that a little bit further. All season tires can work in certain in certain amounts of of snow or certain temperatures where you don't get the heavy snow. We're talking about like real heavy snow when it packs up mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, we get months of snow on the ground and snowstorms when you, where you really do need uh, winter tires. But right. like presumably if you're south of the Mason Dixon line or whatever, like you, you might be able to get away with it if you live in like Atlanta or something and you never... Right. You, you get don't. snow like once a year exactly. or something. And like obviously it's about like don't go out if there's snow on the ground and you don't, and your city uh, doesn't yeah. have the infrastructure to deal with it. but. Yeah. yeah, and so a lot of the arguments I hear uh, about people who don't want to get winter tires, like, oh, it's too expensive, I don't want to spend money on winter tires, but if you use winter tires, you double the life of your summer tires, so right. it really evens out in the end. Um, it's really not that much more expensive, mm -hmm. so that's, that's something to consider. Also, don't use your winter tires in the summer, because they're made of a softer rubber and they go bad real fast. Right. Sammy? I, don't, I know all about that. <laughs> um, I think the joke there is that I've used, uh, I have used winter tires all, tires all year long, mainly because I just have never driven my car during the, the regular, during the rest of the year, so I never had the chance to actually swap the, the tires over. And every time I needed to drive my car, it was just for like 10 kilometers at a time. It didn't add up to anything, but it, you do, there's a drastic performance difference between uh, the winter tires and the, the regular summer tires. Uh, during the regular year. For sure, yeah. So end of story, if you have winter, buy dedicated winter tires. It's the only answer. Where right, are we going from there? Yeah, let's get into some cars. What have you driven? 
Um, so recently I was in Stockholm, Sweden. So it was my first time ever in Scandinavia. I guess if, if Ice, is Iceland considered Scandinavia? Okay, my second time in Scandinavia. I think so. Okay. I don't remember. Anyway, it was my first time in Stockholm. And we drove the Lexus UX there for the very first time. The Lexus UX? Yeah, so that's Lexus's new uh, subcompact crossover. Okay. So it is smaller than the NX. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is basically built on the same platform as the Toyota CHR. Interesting. Yeah, so that's kind of like the size footprint we're looking at here. Well, I mean, the CHR also uses the same platform as the Prius. Um, that's the Toyota Next Generation architecture? TNGA, yeah. Yes. And a bunch of other Toyotas as well. So it's interesting to see that that is, is gaining so much um, versatility and can now be used in a, in a Lexus product. Yeah, it, and so I think a lot, of the, a lot of people thought this would be a big downside of the Lexus, but I actually think it's a great platform. So in the, in the Toyota CHR, it's so much fun to drive. Like, it's not yeah. fast or sporty, but it, like, it feels agile and it's communicative and it's responsive and it actually is surprisingly fun. Well, I think that's because the, in the CHR, they, they paired it to a really, um, I don't know what the best way to say this, a sad powertrain. Um, it just doesn't have enough power. The, the, the transmission as yeah. well is, is really lifeless. But the actual car, the steering and the handling of the CHR yeah. is really good. And I'm hoping that translates to the Lexus. It does, um, except the CHR is a little bit crashy and unrefined because it's a Toyota. So obviously that wouldn't look good in a Lexus. So they beefed it up in certain areas uh, just to make it more luxurious and, you know, softer over rough roads and stuff like that. Cool. But all that fun to drive nature that you find in the CHR makes its way over to the UX. Okay, that sounds like a good deal. But what do they have under the hood? So they had a two-liter four-cylinder engine, naturally okay. aspirated, yeah. and they also have a hybrid version, which okay. is uh, that same motor, but with an Atkinson cycle, okay. with uh, an electric motor and a bigger battery pack. That sounds like it would probably be the one would probably be the right one to get. That's the one I would get. It's yeah. it's actually billed as like the performance version of the two. Interesting. Um, well, it's it's faster by a little bit. It has a little bit more uh, total system output is okay. a little bit higher as well. Okay. It also feels a little bit more planted, I guess, because the battery sits pretty low uh, under the uh, rear seats. Mm -hmm. So it's like the center of gravity is really nice and low. It feels pretty good. Um, but the biggest reason to get the hybrid over the non-hybrid is that it's the only model that comes with all-wheel drive. But we just said that all-wheel drive is useless unless you have winter tires. No, that's not what we said. <laughs> that's completely not what we said. Um, I know a lot of people who will only buy a crossover if it has all-wheel drive because it's a, it's a marketing thing. Like, we all, none of us have all-wheel drive vehicles, no. and we live in Canada, and no. we're just fine in the snow. Like, you don't need all-wheel drive, although it does have its benefits. Right. Yeah. It just provides extra confidence, especially when it's paired to uh, wheel uh, tires. Exactly. But. So this all-wheel drive system is very interesting because uh, in the hybrid model, the electric motor power is the rear axle, but only up to 43 miles an hour. That's still plenty. Which mm -hmm. is fine because that's basically like almost highway speeds. And what happens above that? It just disconnects from the rear axle. I guess that saves some battery power? It's all about efficiency, right? So you yeah. don't, in a crossover, you don't need to have all four wheels driven on the highway. It yeah, just doesn't make a lot of sense. Most like, cars don't. No, it, I mean, it makes sense if in, a, in a performance car to have all four wheels driven, but uh, not in a car like this. So I actually think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, okay. and the electric motor will stop the instant torque, so it'll get you off the line faster. And then yeah, and uh, they use this interesting transmission. Uh, it is CVT, but the interesting part is that it has a mechanical first gear. Oh, okay. oh kind cool. of like the Corolla. Oh, does the Corolla do that? Yeah. Oh, okay, so this a must be the similar. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's only first gear, and it helps a lot because it makes it feel a bit more responsive off the line. So you notice it. So you notice, yeah, I noticed it. Okay. Um, the only thing is it doesn't help you do anything like pass with extra speed right. or anything like that. Like once you're going, like if you're on the highway and you want to make a pass, that CVT is still going to hold you back a little bit. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't terrible. I actually really enjoyed driving it. Okay, that sounds, that all sounds really promising, but an affordable Lexus also has to feel like a Lexus inside. I mean, this thing needs to look somewhat interesting. Yep. Um, and I think it does, at least on the outside. The inside doesn't have all those angles that make like a Lexus, a Lexus. Um, I actually think it's it's a lot nicer than some of the interiors we've seen in other Lexuses up till now because this is the newest one. Interesting. And so the design is is okay, but what's interesting is the textures that they use. So they have a lot of interesting 
uh, textures on the dashboard and in their trim. Okay. Um, like on the on the top of the dash, for example, it's like this. They call it like washi paper. It okay. feels like you know Japanese paper that's like really textured and like you can yeah. feel the fibers in the paper. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's like that. But it's like leather. It's that cool. sounds really nice, actually. I do like it when uh, tri makers aren't beholden to like leather, carbon fiber, and like lacquered, hugely lacquered wood. Yeah. Like, it, like it, those are fine, but they're you know boring. So it's fun when a tri maker yeah. and experiments like, a bit. This it was a really nice interior. Like you can get it with this two tone like cream and dark blue like diamond stitched leather. It looks okay. really nice. Oh. It's very important for Lexus to nail the interior of this car because. The Volvo XC40, which is arguably the best product in its class, yeah. it kills it with the interior, especially mm -hmm. the interior design, the interior materials. Yeah. And this Lexus has to be right up there with it. I, I don't think, like I haven't driven both back to back, but I don't think that the Lexus UX will beat the XC40 in terms of design and like performance okay. and stuff like that. That's just the vibes I get earlier on, but I think it's pretty up it, there. It keeps up? It keeps up, yeah. Okay. The only thing that might hold it back is, you know, that lack of all-wheel drive in the gas model. And the fact that it uses that stupid touchpad uh, for the infotainment <laughs> oh, system. Another, another week where we, where we describe a terrible infotainment I'm sorry. System. I just can't, I can't <laughs> talk about a Lexus product without bringing up that terrible system. Yeah, this is something I've got to bring up because my, my own um, father wants to get a new car. And he currently owns a Lexus RX, but from one that's 10 years old. And one of his favorite parts about it is that it uses a touchscreen. So when I show him the new RX, he's like, what is this? Why isn't it touchscreen? I love the touchscreen. And now he's considering that he might not actually buy a, a new Lexus because he can't stand that yeah, truck Yeah, it's, it's pretty much a deal breaker for me. And I'm not trying to like be a hater or anything like that. Just from a usability standpoint, mm -hmm. it's just not, it does not work. It's too distracting to use while you drive. It's too frustrating to use while you're sitting still. And I mean, like the Lexus has Apple CarPlay, okay. which helps matters, but you still have to use that trackpad to use Apple CarPlay. So it doesn't really fix the problem. But, and especially on a car like this, user experience is such a big deal because yeah. like that's where uh, there, it's a new frontier, right? That's where everybody's putting money in. That's They're trying to keep up with Tesla and the big thing. And uh, <laughs> Volvo has its... Uh, whatever big touch thing, screen, big thing, which I have my own feelings about, but it's still it's flashy and showy, and people like it. So right. Yeah. To so have something that you just can't use, that you can't access the car's features, and like that's actually like a, like a deal breaker here. Like every week we complain about an infotainment system, but we can never come to a conclusion as to what was better. If you're telling me that you think as well the Volvo system with this giant touch screen but small buttons is a problem. And then the touchpad, because while we're moving around in a car, we're hitting whatever, we're rolling around, we miss whatever we're trying to touch on the on the pad is tough. The knob takes too long. It feels like a rotary phone yeah. suddenly. Like, yeah. what is the right system Just to give use? us a touch screen. Like, give us a touch screen. Um, With ginormous buttons, like we're old people in a, in a, using a remote control? Well, no, no, friggin' Uconnect. Give me a Uconnect system that doesn't reboot on me every yeah, day. Yeah, like, like that also has its issues. It keeps, it keeps messing up. So there is no perfect system. It all takes, like I think, um, a, like a, an acquired taste. Each of them has their benefits. And yeah, their but that's hardly our fault that automakers no, can't I mean, make our, our, app, our phone designers. Like, yeah. And, and, but you're right. Big buttons, permanent buttons that are located permanently. So you know exactly where they are. At yeah, all times. and then you don't have deal. to go through the touch screen to find a menu. Menus. You know? Right. Um, Don't hide stuff from me. I want it to be in front of me all the time. Yeah. I always hide things from Sebastian. <laughs> it explains a lot about your relationship. Um, but you know what? Talking about the Lexus and its interior design, this is something that, Lex that Lexus is trying to do much. Like They're trying to showcase some of their creativity um, in terms of design, not just exterior design, which has become really, uh, I think the best word is expressive. <laughs> they're wild looking cars. They look like they're flowers that are blooming in, in, in some sci-fi dystopian future. But the interior, uh, especially after driving the Lexus LS, which is their flagship mm. sedan, while that car doesn't drive particularly well, it has a unique blend of materials. It has this pleated, this pleated uh, material inside it. It has these floating um, like handles in it. It's very different, very unique, and it makes it stand out and feel like something special. Mm -hmm. And if the UX can deliver on that, which is the flagship product, 
if the UX, which is the, the I guess the most affordable, the entry level yeah. vehicle, if you can deliver on that that experience as well, then Lexus is doing a really good job. I think they delivered on that, especially because it'll start at thirty two grand in the wow. US for the gas model, and then they add two grand more on top of that for the hybrid. Like to get that kind of quality at that price point mm -hmm. is a really big deal. And I know we there was a lot of there were a few complaints about the UX, but in general, I thought it was really good. I was really really impressed by it. Ken, we just talked about the elephant in the room, which is that it has a really dumb name. I hate its UX. name so the much. The UX, Two, so... 250? 250 yeah. H and the 200. Okay. Yeah, so the UX, it stands for Urban Explorer. Yeah, but it Urban also stands Why for... Why do you have to do a Power Rangers pose? <laughs> because e got... Explorer starts with an E, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> Explorer. And... Uh, UX already stands for user experience, which oh. is a thing. Which it has a terrible user which is, experience. Which has a terrible user experience, which all automakers are talking about now. Yeah. So it's really annoying to talk about the, the Lexus UX is UX. It's so <laughs> dumb. I know it is. It is pretty silly, um, but it is. A, it is a pretty good car, and I think some of the some of the ways they try to get away from that terrible uh, touchpad stuff, like it'll have. Uh, like you, you could use your smartwatch to you know check your fuel levels or like turn the car on or whatever. Okay. So that's kind of cool. It also has uh, standard driver assistance features. Okay. So for that's thirty-two grand, that. you get standard adaptive cruise control and all that kind of stuff. I think that's I mm. think that's expected in that class now. Really, a yeah. standard though. Especially when you buy something with that badge, I don't it needs think to come with technology. I don't think any other car in its segment offers that as standard. That's the differentiator. I'm going to you on that. I think maybe Volvo might offer it really early on. Maybe not Pro Pilot, like the, sorry, they have one that's called Pro Assist or, or something like that, or Piloted, Piloted Assist, I think it's called. I'm mixing up all of our names <laughs> and packages here. But um, I know that so many other, I mean, Toyota wa wants to do this with its Corollas and stuff too. Mm -hmm. And um, I can see that. And I, I think some GM models will come with it as well. So I think it's to be expected. I mean, none of the Germans are doing it. That's true. Right. Um, and I wanted to bring up the Germans as well in another aspect. The Lexus UX uses a platform that's, that has more mainstream roots. I mean, sure. like I said, the next generation Corolla, the Prius and the, and the Toyota CHR, these are all Toyota products, not Lexus products. And then we've also mentioned that Audi and Volkswagen products share their underpinnings in some way with the, I think it's called MQB yep. platform. And then BMW with the X1 and the Mini share some parts too. So we're seeing some, some crossover. Are the platforms being so good that they're able to be used in a luxury, like a luxury inter like experience as well? Or are they just, this is the small car, but better than it is the mainstream model? It's weird to see that crossover happen. Uh, I think uh, it no makes a lot intended. of sense, but I mean, it's not a straight carryover platform. Like, they do make a lot of tweaks to make sure it lives up to that, you know, Lexus-like experience right. that people are expecting. Because, like, when we said about the, the Countryman and the BMW X1, we actually found the Countryman to be more um, exciting, interesting to drive, and even had a more uh, fun interior. And if that keeps happening, if you're just going to take the, the normal model and strip it of its personality and say it's a luxury car now, that's a problem. That's a problem. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, contained within that argument, though, is that the bigger cars, so like the X3 and that stuff, that has a BMW chassis. The bigger Audis all have the MLB platform, which is an Audi chassis. Right. So, like, I understand what you're saying about how it's like the smaller cars are using lower, not lower quality. They're not using, they're using real. They're not using luxury stuff. Yeah. But also, like, there was a time when Cadillac was trying to convince you that a Malibu was a Cadillac, you know? Like, yeah, <laughs> those were called the terrible times. They were the terrible times. So it could also be that they've, like, this is, this is all that's acceptable. And this is the only way to make, them, to make the money, to make the prices that they have to set these at make sense is by using... Yeah, and I, and I don't think that, like, diluting the platform is that big of a deal because they have to, that, that forces them to put more effort on making the rest of the experience more luxurious. Right. So they focus a lot on, you know, the interior, on the tech, and I think it's fine. Okay. Yeah. So what did you like about this car? I liked its driving dynamics. Let's sum it up, the driving dynamics. They yeah. were really good. Uh, I, think it, I think it looks okay. Um, I like that it drove like a hatchback and not a crossover. Okay. And I, what? No, it's true. That's that's. Uh, it is a thing that seems to be happening more and more with the X2. It's just a hatchback. 
all these things that they're calling crossovers. But people, I crossovers people, are supposed to drive more like cars and less like SUVs. So that's the other thing about this is that like if Isn't you wanted, if you wanted that high seating position and you wanted to like step into a car like up and in, yeah. then you know this might not be the right one for you because even the seating position is just like a hatchback. Right. Like there's no ingress egress. Like you just get out like you would a hatchback. You don't have to jump out. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for people who might be older and have like, it's hard on their hips or their back, they might want uh, a taller crossover. Okay. The, the cargo capacity is also really small in the UX. Okay. Yeah. They didn't even release figures for the seats down figure. Oof. Yeah. So that just tells me it's really, they don't want to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> and the hybrid has an even smaller cargo capacity. Yeah. Because of the electric motors. Yeah, exactly. But in general, really good product. It, it's not perfect, but it is really good. Okay, I mean, are you expecting perfection at that in that price point in that class? I have to say that Volvo is very good. It it is very good. It does answer a lot of questions, and it does feel more like an SUV. So it's got a yeah. little bit more of that hop up. But it's got cargo space, too. and it has better attention to detail. Yeah, which I think is uh, something that the UX might have. Uh, and I think that's something that the benefit that's the benefit of having. Uh, Again, platform sharing, but having yeah. having a, a big money coming in behind you and you being the engineering company, yeah. mm -hmm. that's that's the benefit that you get. Well, I mean, if we're going to bring up the Volvo, I mean, I have to mention it's a tiny bit. I think it can be a bit more expensive than this Lexus. It is a little bit, yeah. And it doesn't share its parts with anything anything else, really. Not yet. Its platform, you mean? Yeah. Oh. Well, eventually there's going to be linked in toes and stuff like that. Based okay. Off of it. But those aren't here yet. But that's what I'm, that's. You're the, starting with the with the. You're starting product. with the engineer. Well, yeah. The, these these this is the most expensive one. Like this is the. I think that's the right way to do it. Absolutely, and it makes a lot of sense. It's the same thing about the infotainment. Like I know I have my issues with the infotainment, but when you get into an XC40 and see an XC90s infotainment. You feel special, mm -hmm. whereas if you were to get into the XC90 and see the XC40s, if they had done it, if yeah, they had started they smaller, yeah, than yeah they had, I could see you that. Would have felt cheated. Yeah, with the UX, actually, they used a lot of things that were uh, debuted in the LC. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. So you know that little like oh, toggle but switch that's not up even there. That good. <laughs> I know, but the fact that it made its way down through so the lineup. So it has this drive mode <laughs> on the shroud, on the gauge cluster shroud. Yeah. It's so, it's so silly. It's it's pretty dumb because you can't reach it unless you like you you really move your body forward. Time to put it into sport mode. First of all, putting a hybrid cr crossover into sport mode. Yeah. Well, it does come in F Sport. You can get F Sport in both the 200 and the 250H. So yeah. hey. You're confusing people. The messaging is really uh, all over the place. Here. <laughs> I don't know. My my feeling is that like the people who are driving the LC are not going to shop around for this and the other way around. So okay. like really, if you step into the UX without having driven the LC, you're going to still think it's nice. Okay, I get you. Cool. Do you want to keep going to the next car we've got? Because I think the next one we have is far more entertaining than your than your life. Fine. <laughs> Gosh. Um, yeah, I, got, so I got to drive the BMW M5, and Ooh. this is a wild vehicle. This is one of the most powerful, fastest cars that BMW has ever made. Under the hood of it is a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8 that makes 600 horsepower <laughs> and 553 pound feet of torque. It's wild. It really is insane. And you know what? I was making the argument, and we have a really fun video coming up. Um, not not in this video, but <laughs> later, uh, real soon, we have a really fun video where I, where I try to describe that the M5 is a bunch of different cars in one package. And, what do you um, mean? So I said that, you know, it's a big family-friendly uh, sedan. Okay. You can, you can stick some car seats in there, no problem. There's a huge trunk. You'd be surprised at how big this trunk is. Not only that, those rear seats fold down, you get even more space, too. I mean, it's comfortable. It's usable, too. Okay. And then not only that, you know, it has, like, these different settings, and I'll explain those in a second, um, that can actually make life easier for people who, who, or for families that have multiple drivers. So here's one of, the, one of the things that I do not like about the M5. To get the full potential out of the car, there are, it's, it feels like a never-ending list of options, performance options that you need to pick from. Every single component from this car has three settings. So here, the, I'm not joking, here's the actual list. The engine has Comfort, Sport, and Sport Plus. The transmission has Comfort, Sport, and Sport Plus. As well as a manual mode that has Comfort, Sport, and Sport Plus. So the, the, the suspension. The transmission has six settings? Tra yeah, technically yes. <laughs> wow. The suspension has Comfort, Sport, and Sport Plus. Of course. The steering has Comfort, Sport, and Sport Plus. <laughs> 
<laughs> the stability control. Yes. Has four has <laughs> M dynamic mode, which is with four wheel drive, <laughs> on full on, and two wheel drive mode with everything off. Three settings. <laughs> I'm now, already try to imagine. Try to imagine. I don't even know. Like I, I had the car for a week. I still don't know what the perfect setup for me was. You know what I mean? Like every day I tried a new thing, and I'm like, I think I like this marginally more than the other option I had. So it's a very bizarre idea to have a car that is so granular. And I have to go and do th do all the work and figure out what the most fun version of it. So it's is. just is it just a big nerd car? It really is. But in the video, I describe and I'm I'm giving it away here. And I know Brad is shaking his head at me, saying, "Stop ruining stop. the video. No one's stop. gonna watch it now." I say that if you have multiple people driving the car, there's these two big shortcuts on it: M1 and M2. And so they say when you figure out what your your favorite drive mode is, you pre-program M1 to that mode. So you just jump in instead of t toggling everything. <laughs> you just press M1, and it gets that mode. It's a shortcut. Okay. But at the same time, if you have like preferences, my like the way I drive versus the way my my fiance drives, we can just set those up for one another. We just have to fight over who's M1 and who's M2. Anyways, there's other ways that you can describe it. First of all, it's so fast. It's terrifying that a 4,300 pound car can hit 60 miles per hour in 3.2 seconds yeah. and get a top speed of 189 miles per hour. I mean, that's not a surprise. I mean, it should do that. It's terrifying to feel a car this it's bigger than this room that we're in, okay? It can carry your children, your family, all of your gear, your groceries, and it can just go pew! <laughs> Gone. Like, gone. Right. Okay? It's terrifying to feel something that big and heavy go is that it, fast. Is it fun, though? It's thrilling. Okay. I don't know if it's fun, because, you know what? We're all enthusiasts. We've mm -hmm. all put different types of cars on the track. We've all played with different types of cars. To me, a 4,300-pound car on the track is actually more of a handful than it is fun. Yeah. You're constantly wrestling the idea that it has so much weight being thrown around. But doesn't it have a whole bunch of tech in it that is supposed I just, to I just compensate? All of that tech. I know, but I just need to put it in the right drive mode to make it easier to drive. Which, by the way, I've been doing a little bit of math on this. I think that means that it has 216 different, different options. Different you, combinations? Different combinations that you can run through. Yeah, well, six to the power of three, I'm figuring is how. Anyway, so yes, it's you can. Uh, yeah. That's a lot makes, to go It makes through. sense. And then, so Why? you're gonna find the one out of those two. Or two. I have two. I have two, two shortcuts. Yeah, exactly. So you're gonna go through it, take 216 laps of yeah. your of your racetrack, and feel. Hmm, I think. I think with, uh, you know, with the transmission this in this mode. mode and the stability control in this mode. It's a you, need like, like, you need like an Excel spreadsheet, spreadsheet yeah. for all this. It's a bit it's much. Too that's, much. That's what I'm trying to say here. And. I, I enjoy driving it because, first of all, it is it truly is really tough. It's, it's a badass car. Um, a lot of people look at it and say, oh, it's just another M5. But then when you hear it, it's gnarly sounding. It sounds nice. so good. Yeah. And that's good because BMW has been caught cheating their, sound, their engine noises by pumping them through the speakers. Mm -hmm. This thing has legit sound. It sounds wild. It does. I'm happy to hear that. And anything that you come across, it'll be faster than uh, even supercars, it's going to be faster than. Well, the all-wheel drive model, Road and Track tested it at 2.8 seconds to 60. It's insane. <laughs> That's insane. Like, that I is cannot. So fast. That's I, like McLaren, the 720S yeah, yeah. got. That, like, yeah. That's how fast yeah. it was. It has launch control. So, I mean, like, once you just step on it, it really takes off. Mm -hmm. it's, it, and like I said, it just makes you laugh that there's something this big that can do that kind of speed. I also think it's the best. it's the best-looking BMW right now. What? Well, I think it's better it looking than the 3 Series. Okay, that makes sense. I think sense. it's better looking than the 4 Series. That's That one's marginal, but I still think, I still I would prefer a 5 Series, but I'll listen to arguments otherwise. Okay. Uh, one argument, there's only one argument. And you the can, 2 you, Series, no. I don't think it looks very good. The i8 does look good, but it looks like... i8. Uh, i8. Definitely i8. And the 8 Series, which was recently debuted, looks gorgeous. Okay, I'm sorry, you're talking about big cars? Oh, the, uh, the 5 Series is a little large. The, the 8 Series is enormous. That, that's, I don't care about that. I'm still, you're, talking about, you're talking about looks. And the 8 Series... Actually, you're right, though. The 5 Series has perfect proportions. It's got it really doesn't look proportions. awkward. Yeah. It, it does doesn't look, look like good. it's bubbling over in some weird way. No. It doesn't have a bangle butt. No. Yeah, it doesn't have that weird uh, like nose that points downward. Yeah. As the, like, I'm angry. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I know the, like, the M3 and the M4 have that, and I never liked it. Um, but yeah, it looks good. It looks like... A, like a big, beefy, muscular sedan. Right. And I, I dig it. That it looks subtle. 
But I still think it looks good. Like, it just has really nice proportions. It's not tacky. Yeah. yeah. Do you think it looks better than its chief rival, the E63 AMG? Yes. Yes, I, I, I'd say so. It although... That's I, a really classic. car. Although... Color. Okay, so which one would you rather drive, though, if oh, it came no. down to it? Oh, no. <laughs> because <laughs> you know people tough, are going to that's ask. That's a tough question to ask. For me... It's got to be the E-Class, because I don't have to deal with, 14, how many, 200 different settings or, or variables? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. To me, the E-Class, the e I put it into Sport Plus, and I have everything I want, yeah. okay? It is that shortcut. Yeah. I can later adjust settings individually, but boom, Sport Plus, yeah. I'm good. Sounds great. It also has an all-wheel drive system, nearly, I think, actually just over 600 horsepower. It also comes in a wagon. Yeah, it comes in a wagon. <laughs> And and you're right. I mean, there's there's that, and it sounds great. It just sounds amazing. Yeah. I mean, if, if for as good as the M5 sounds, the E63 sounds this much better. Yeah, oh. I think I would. I'm in the same boat as you, where I would much rather drive the E63, especially in wagon format, just because it's less complicated. <laughs> like we're all drivers. We like to drive. We don't need a car telling us that like this is how we think you like to drive. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I like it when the engineers have faith in the setup. And like, I understand why it's tempting to have like drive modes, but I also think it, it doesn't help. You. It kind of gets in the way. Mm -hmm. every, like, it doesn't make it so that your transition from being on the highway to being on a twisty road, that's not simpler. Like, you, yeah. You get off the highway, and now you've got to take it. You've got to take it. Whatever those uh, those arm garlands, and you've got to take it your hat and start doing calculations, <laughs> and be like, okay, so I want to do this one, this one, that one, this one, this one. Oh, but there's a pothole. Oh, in the but there's the a road. pothole. I, in the road. Road. You know, I better put the suspension and comfort mode. That like Claire Danes meme with all the math in the background. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, but you know what? While we're talking about these these kinds of cars, honestly, we're in a in a really interesting age of like big performance vehicles and I know a lot of people joked about you know the SUVs that could do cra crazy speeds like the Trackhawk the X5M and X6M those AMGs that are huge too and the Cayenne and, and Urus and all those other things but then we've also got the smaller version of those which are also quite interesting fun to drive the M5 the E63 AMG the Porsche Panamera and both of the both versions the Sport Turismo and mm -hmm. the regular Panamera there's some wild the Julia. family vehicle, yeah, the Julia, wild family vehicles with incredible performance, and I think the BMW is right near the top there. Cool. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a little expensive. It's one hundred four thousand dollars. It starts at one hundred four. <laughs> a little expensive. One hundred four. But as I as I des describe in the video, it's a bunch of cars packed in one. Um, right. I'm sure you can get it into like the hundred fifty range oh, too no, easily. No problem. You yeah. just add a package and uh, a, a paint finish, and suddenly, boom. Actually, and I wanted to talk about the paint finish of this car. It was, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it was their blue, their, their extra option blue. The really deep paint. one? It is kind of deep. In certain colors, it looks purple. Mm -hmm. In other, in, I mean, in certain shades, it looks purple. And in certain, like, light conditions, it looks bright blue. And I got a lot of attention with this, this particular comment. People were like, they didn't care what car it was. <sighs> That's a really cool looking blue. That's you interesting. Saw yeah, yeah, I saw it. It's an, I think it's a really nice shade of blue. Like, it looks really good. And BMW is good at that, honestly. They're good at picking colors that people notice. And yeah. when I was in the X2 as well. Is that the that paint looks expensive, too? Like, that, expensive. Uh, that bright yellow in the X2 is sweet. Yeah, everybody, everybody noticed it. Immediately, people were like, oh, what's that car? They, they picked it out as special. Uh, and Sammy's shaking his head at me. Do you not remember that weird 4 Series that looks like, gold, like mustard colored? It that was is a baby historical poop. color. <laughs> it was. It it's bad. Terrible. It's bad. Okay. I agree. But with you are right. It's cool to see BMW still like they have faith in colors. Like people want colorful cars, yeah. not just and several the, shades of them gray. Them and FCA, and, then, and they're yes. picking good ones too, which isn't an easy thing to do, as Nissan proves to us whenever it picks a shade of green. <laughs> you really hate that that like pea soup color. Because I like Rogue green car and and ash guy. Yeah, I thought it was very unique. It was I expensive. thought it was fine. It, it was unique. <laughs> I mean, so it's pooping your pants, but it's not a good thing. That's not unique. It's everyone, so harsh. Everyone poops their pants with their children and old people. It, uh, fair enough, yeah. Anyways, anyway, I think we're getting on. off topic here. <laughs> um, yeah, what do we have next? So we have a, we did a three row, three way, which sounds weird, but we did a th comparison of three row crossovers. 
Nailed it. Okay. We did not have a three-way. <laughs> um, so we had the Subaru Ascent, the Honda Pilot, and the Volkswagen Atlas. And all three of them are pretty new. They all have uh, three rows of seats for families, people who don't want minivans, stuff like that. Yeah, what's the deal? People don't like minivans anymore. Yeah. I don't know. I like minivans. I mean, people who buy the Pilot should be admitting to themselves that they like minivans because that's what they bought. Well, the Pilot also feels like a minivan. Like <laughs> it drives like a minivan. minivan. It is so family friendly. And you might as well just get the minivan because if you get the Odyssey, you can get a little vacuum. The, I think that's the trade-off. I mean, the, the Odyssey comes with a vacuum. The Pilot comes with all-wheel drive. And to be fair, being a minivan in this class is a really good thing. Like, minivans are very good at what they do. Yes. Family yeah, they're vehicles, family right. friendly vehicles. And the Pilot is really good at that. Like, it's soft, it's cushiony. It's you, so comfortable. You can fit it's a six pack between the seats, not that you would. Uh, it does. It has so much spa space inside of it. And I don't just mean like cargo space, I mean like just weird bin things that are bins. Like, this is a bin now, this is a bin. So I many storage put, cubbies. Yeah, I can put. Whatever I want in, in hidden compartments. I'm going to lose everything I own in this car. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's got a little mirror in the sun, like the place where you put your sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. It's got two settings, and one of them is a mirror, so you can keep an eye on your kids behind you. Actually, all of them have that. No. All, of these, all of these vehicles have that. All of them except very, one. You don't think the Atlas had it? I don't think the, the Atlas, Atlas had it. it. The Atlas didn't have a sunglass thing. Uh, <gasps> I thought they did. Either. It looked like it. Okay. All right, fine. My mistake. Anyway, it was good, and it has like a ton of USB ports, lots of storage cubbies, lots of cup holders. But was the pilot the best? Are we allowed no. to give it away? Uh oh. So we have a video on this coming up. Um, Another fun video. Yeah, <laughs> we ended up being really impressed by the Subaru Ascent. And Is that just because it's the newest car, and we and, and you just like new cars? <laughs> no, that's totally not it. If we were judging based on that, it'd be like, this car is not a McLaren, therefore I don't yeah, like exactly. it. But okay. to be fair, it is the newest car, so it kind of should be the best, right? Like, they have yeah. the benefit of having all this information, all this data on other cars. Mm -hmm. So, like, and they did good work with it. Like, they worked really hard with what they knew the segment needed to be. Yeah. 19 cup holders. Well, 19 cup holders. and I think the, the element of surprise goes a long do way. Do you need 19 Nobody cup holders? Nobody needs 19 cup holders. It's just a funny number you can tell people at a cocktail party that is full of Subaru enthusiasts. Yes, well, Jody, what are you driving? These yes, days? oh, well, I have this car. It has 19 cup holders. Oh, 19, you yes. said. Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm um, such a card. So, funny story. When we were shooting, this uh, police officer came up to us and was like, what? are you guys doing? <laughs> right. And they so saw us, they saw us going in and out of a parking lot with these cars and they were really concerned that we were up to something no Yeah, no, so no we good. thought we were in trouble. We were like, oh, we're just doing a car comparison. You want to check out the cars? And yeah. he came and checked out the cars with us and he asked us which one was the best and we said, we, we think the Subaru is. And he was so surprised and he right. asked us why and then we said, you know what, it has a really great interior. It drives really nicely. Then he's like, a Subaru with a nice interior. <laughs> and we had to show them. We had to actually open, we opened the doors, we yeah. showed them, we hid all of our, all of our, you know, goods yeah. so that he wouldn't w uh, wonder where we got all that stuff from. Uh, we had to hide the number of cameras so that they weren't like, do you have a permit to shoot here? <laughs> I was concerned about the drugs. Oh, right. They're I mean. Not, they're a prescription. <laughs> so, anyways, what were we saying? Oh, right. And he, sh he saw the interior of this thing and he was like, oh, wow. Yeah. This looks far better than any other uh, Subaru that he's ever seen. And especially in comparison to the other two cars that were there, it looks like a, a step up. Mm -hmm. Now, think about that for a second. Subaru <laughs> has, has a better, better interior. interior than Honda and Volkswagen, two automakers with luxury divisions. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or are associated to luxury, luxury automakers. Do you think that there's a part of that that's like uh, Volkswagen and, uh, Honda and Honda saying can't well, step on yeah. their big brother's shoes? I think there might be a point there, definitely. And Subaru can just be like, we keep going. This is We've made this car the best we can. Mazda is right. like that as well. We've yeah. said the CX-9 has a gorgeous interior. I can't wait to compare the CX-9 and the Ascent now. Yep. Um, because those two have very, in they're, they're two small automakers making really impressive products. And yeah. I think they there's a good there's a good story to be told. They there. both have a lot going on, and they both tell two very different stories too. Because you have the CX-9, which is like the stylish, like driving, performance-oriented mm -hmm. one, and then you have the Ascent, which is just like really, really good at doing what it was meant to do. It has so many USB ports, <laughs> and they're fast ones too. Yeah, fast charging USB and USB C. Yeah. 
I was really impressed with the, with this uh, with this. Uh, sorry, not USB C. US yeah. yeah, the fast charging one. Sorry. Um, and it also drove really well. Like that four cylinder engine was pretty good. I was. <sighs> You didn't like it. I don't know if I don't like it. It is just weird that they have only one engine option, while the other ones can have multiple engines. I mean, the, uh, I Atlas think if has it's good engines. enough, no, the Atlas has two engines that are like not that different. The four cylinder <laughs> right. is makes all nearly as much power and more torque than the V6, and gets better fuel economy. But people are buying the V6, and yeah, I and because. I've spoken to VW's engineers, and they're really annoyed about it because yeah. they have. You know, they have uh, quotas to meet for uh, Right, for so they want fuel people efficiency. to buy the four-cylinder. They want people to buy the four-cylinder. So they have to keep working to make the four-cylinder better and better and better. But people see a big car like that and they're like, no, I think you need six cylinders. <laughs> I'm the same way. I see the <laughs> I Atlas. I thought that, yeah. And it, I think it, but the four-cylinder Atlas gets to 60 faster than the six-cylinder Atlas. Interesting. So, and the same thing goes for the Ascent. Like, I, I, I agree with you, like, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, but it could use a flat six. But when I was driving it, okay, every car could use a flat six. That's fair enough. But there was a, it was it was quick off the line. It, yeah. I never felt like it was yeah. slow like some lower model Impreza's kind of do. Yeah, I think the CVT has a lot to to do with that. And again, this is one of the issues with the ascent. A CVT is never going to lead to the most premium feel. No, no. it's going to groan. It's going to whine. I didn't but think it was that bad. The ascent does have a well tuned CVT. It actually it jumps up to the right ratio, and then as soon as you, it can tell that it's no longer needed, it winds right the heck back down. You never get that weird, like, excessive groan or whine. They really too, yeah. And you're like, I'm done now. He's still going. <laughs> get into the regular gear. <laughs> what car does that? Sorry. <laughs> Nissan's? Yeah, Nissan. Uh, the it's, Honda HRV. Except that it's a worse sound, too. <laughs> so the Subaru does have a well tuned powertrain. It is just, it is an interesting combination. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I could see that. But I mean, just driving it, it didn't get in the way. Like, I'd never thought it could use more power. I didn't think the no, seat... No, it gets it, out of its way very well. Yeah, and I thought everything just worked really well. Um, I really like the interior, like we said, that brown leather. It's got, like, interesting uh, textures, mm -hmm. like, two-tone stuff. The design, it just makes a lot of sense. Everything is functional. Right. Nothing, nothing like, annoyed me about the Ascent. No, me neither. Yeah, it whereas was... in the other two cars, there were things that, like, immediately turned me off. Okay. Let's go into the other cars then, because we didn't talk a lot about the Atlas. We, we, we mentioned that it's, its engines are, it's a weird, a weird, uh, weird offering for the mm -hmm. engines. Yeah. Um, this is a huge, huge she big. crossover. It has so much cargo space. Once you fold down all those rear seats, it's like being in, an, in a pickup truck. Yeah. It's like huge. It, there is a lot of space. Um, the problem is that like, you can tell that all of the buttons inside of it and all of the stuff was designed for smaller cars. Like, <laughs> Because it just everything looked so far away. Everything looked yeah. distant and like kind of empty. <laughs> like perspective wise. Like perspective. Like, like there's a weird perspective shift going on. You're like, no, I know I've seen all of this before in a yeah, golf, but because it seems yeah. bigger. It feels like you're in a golf and even the steering wheel is like taken right it's out of a golf. Right out but of then, a then golf. you look behind you and you're like, holy crap, there's two whole rolls <laughs> back there. Yeah, it's golf <laughs> yeah. a I know, and it drives a lot like a golf, which is very strange. <laughs> um, it's a weird that feeling. Like a good thing. It's a Technically, it should be a good thing, but, but it not. is far too uh, crashy and stiff for this segment. Yeah. I feel like the Atlas would have done a lot better if it was a little bit softer and, sm and, and more quieter. comfortable and it more quiet. It needs to be quieter. Yeah. Right? yeah. That was my biggest issue with it. And the materials that they use aren't the greatest. Again, I think that the materials they used work on the smaller cars because there's less of it. But when you expand it to like yeah. 17 times bigger, <laughs> you're like, it gets kind of like mushy in the middle. And you're like, oh, you, this plastic kind of feels cheap now. And like, this, mm -hmm. It's fine, but it just doesn't excel. One of my favorite parts about the Atlas is that um, both of you guys own older Volkswagen products. And some of the switch gear and knobs it's exactly the look same. Exactly the same. Yeah. And I don't mean that you guys like have an old car like from last year. You guys have multiple year old cars. My like car is ten years old. And you My can car is still feel, um, feel the influence. Yeah. It's just really familiar in that weird way. Now that might be good for somebody who owned a Volkswagen. And Volkswagen did say that when they made it, they were like, "We want." Golf owners yeah. who have outgrown the golf to get into this thing. So let's make it as familiar as possible. Let's make it drive as much as a like a golf as possible. But for everyone else they want to they want to go into the car and remember their friends 
Yeah, exactly. Golf from high school. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah we used to stone the body with them, man. It was yeah. great. <laughs> you hotbox in this golf. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it would be hard to hotbox the Atlas. That would be it's very so big. It's to too do. big. Yeah. Um, yeah, oh, that's God, that's yeah. important. It fails the, the famous <laughs> autodrive hotbox test. The hot test. Box test. <laughs> what I like about the Atlas is one killer feature. It's that virtual cockpit or whatever it's called. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, in, in the Comes right out of the Audi. Cluster. It's so yeah. cool. It's the only thing that I think has it has going for it, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise the car is way too way too expensive and doesn't deliver on that price. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think it came in last place oh. in our uh, crossover comparison. Um, and yeah, the, the Honda Pilot, and normally we would like cars that drive better, but I, I don't, like I actually preferred the way the Honda Pilot drove over the Atlas. Okay. Because it was big and squishy and soft and very, very comfortable. And it was everything that I expected a car like that to be. It, it knew what it was. The yeah. Atlas was trying to be turkey pepperoni, but like the... <laughs> the Hold up, the there's pilot. nothing wrong with turkey bites. You gotta stop that. <laughs> But the, the the pilot knew what it was. It was like, yeah, this is a big family yeah. vehicle. It's going to feel like a big family vehicle. Even and your family's not going to puke in the back of it. The steering wheel is enormous yeah. in the pilot. It's it like you're driving a bus. It was weirdly angled. Like, it wasn't like angled like this. And no, it's turn. like a little, it's like bit, a little bit forward. Down, like so it's like <laughs> <laughs> it felt like a bus. Yeah. And I kind of liked that about it, though. Yeah. Um, and it was uh, easy to get in and out of third row. Mm-hmm. Lots of storage cubbies, like we mentioned. Um, no TV. volume knob in the 2018 model. Oh, it's infotainment. Sucks. The 2019 model will get a volume yes. knob, thank goodness. Um, but yeah, the infotainment isn't very good. Honda's really, system is kind of janky. It's really slow. It doesn't feel like it's responding to you. You touch the thing, and you're like starting to smash the the screen. It just no, I don't know if we were just like pressed for time, but we also couldn't get the HDMI port working in the back of the. Well, we, we did briefly, did. and then <laughs> it went away, and nobody knew why. We're just like, oh. So don't touch anything once you get the HDMI port work. It makes you feel like your teacher was when, you were, when she was trying to set up the VCR at school. I was like, well, hold on, now, was it this button? Or? Oh, VCRs. Remember those? I do remember those. I miss those. But now we don't need to use them. And we don't need to carry around giant stacks of tapes. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yes. Is that it? Do we have any more cars to talk about? Yeah, I think no, I it. think that's it. It was a pretty light week over at Auto Guide. All right. Yeah. So that's it for this week's episode. Thanks for watching, and if you want to hear our last episode, be sure to hit us up on YouTube, or actually you can subscribe to us there, and you can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast client. So Spotify, we're definitely on Spotify. We're on iTunes, we're on Google Play Music, we're definitely on Google Podcasts. So Pocket Casts. All of those yeah. things, and if you listen to us, be sure to rate us, be sure to give us a review. We love hearing your feedback. And we'll actually read some reviews out on the air. I mean, assuming you make it entertaining enough. That's a <laughs> challenge. That's a challenge out there. Um, so thanks again for, for listening. And be sure to come back to AutoGuide's YouTube channel and even AutoGuide.com to see the latest automotive news, reviews, features, and comparisons. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.